look at them with different eyes. And of course, Picasso was quite good at moving those eyes around. I'd like to introduce our host today, Mr. James Ahola. Please give an arr cat welcome. James, the con is yours. Thank you very much, Kathy. Welcome to the Inclusion Impact panel discussion created by Melanie Tadeo. We live in an incredibly diverse universe. The, un the land that we live on has multiple vegetation, wildlife, even geology. If we go look into our oceans and our lakes, we find again, diversity and full of life. And if we were to look up into the sky, into the heavens, we see a plethora of stars, each and every one of them as unique and individual as you and I. For the human race is equally diverse. We come in all shapes, colors, sizes, languages, ethnic backgrounds, and the list goes on. And it creates an incredibly beautiful, diverse tapestry. As intelligent beings, we created a nomenclature to help us to define the subtle differences. What was a rose versus lilac versus orchid? However, as William Shakespeare so eloquently stated, a rose by any other name smells just as sweet. When it comes to humanity, a problem occurs when the lines that help us to define become lines that divide, that say, no, you're not welcome. You're not included. But why? Because it's all nomenclature. We have known for centuries, if not millennia, that you and I are no different. We both have dreams and desires. We share the same breath. And yes, we both bleed. We are no different. Imagine with me, if you will, that the world was like Shakespeare had suggested, a stage, and we're all mere actors upon it, a unique cast of characters with individual roles to play. Now imagine a stage where all are allowed to play out their role in full freedom and live it out as they should. Can you see it? A stage full of roses and lilacs, orchids, wildlife, sea creatures, moons, and stars. A stage that is diverse and full of life as it should be. Now, for us to have this wonderful discussion about inclusivity and what this new world will look like, we have a diverse group of individuals, starting with Melanie Tadeo, who is passionate advocate for inclusion. She's an educator, a resilient entrepreneur, and author. After a massive stroke left her legally blind and partially paralyzed, Melanie has overcome many barriers which led to her share her story and start her own business, which in turn, inspires others to embrace their abilities. Gerda Felix is a connector, an active listener, a visionary, a spirit-led communicator, and spiritual life coach. Born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, Gerda moved to Montreal, Canada, and now resides in London. Her studies took her from anywhere from languages, hotel and restaurant management, to psychology, and finally, to spiritual life coaching. Gerda works with women, empowering them to be who they are and step into their calling. Albert Chang has been an active member of Toastmasters since 2011. He was born and raised in Canada, where he's had the opportunity to experience many different cultures. And being a member of Toastmasters has provided him with greater exposure to other cultures and also to see how others respond to it. We have Yun An Bai, a certified world-class speaking coach, club sponsor and secretary of OCOW Toastmasters Club. She's the founding member of Miracle Chinese English Bilingual Toastmasters Club, District 86, 2019 International Speech Champion, Region 6, 2019 International Speech Second Place winner, and District 86, 2016, 2017 President of the Year Award recipient and past District 86 Speakers Bureau. Iqbal Sandu, 
has been a member of Toastmasters since 2015 and found it very helpful in developing his communication and leadership skills. He is currently an area director for Area 31 in Division B in District 86. He's a project management development professional and worked with various employers over 35 years in his career. And he has a BA and MBA. Mark Brown is chairman of Connect for Life. He's also a fundraising and inclusion impact guest panelist. Krista Wowen is a 22 year rheumatoid arthritis warrior and a remission that all bodies and abilities count. And finally, Wayne J. Tuttle. With over three decades of a as a professional speaker and a career in sales and marketing, paired with multiple appearances on national radio and television, as well as a full-length documentary featuring his life and dream of becoming a certified scuba diver, you will soon experience Wayne's infectious can-do attitude. His powerful, inspiring message will shift attitudes, influence new ideas, and share new ways of doing things that will inform and inspire and motivate audiences. Welcome panelists. Now, we all have a group of questions. Now, if you do have, as a guest, have any questions, I do ask that you please enter them into the chat, because there will be a 30-minute period at the end where we will be wanting to answer your questions. But before that, we have some questions for the panelists. And every single one of them, I would like them to answer one question at first, which is, what does inclusion mean to you? I'll start off with Melanie. What Thank you so much, mean? James. Inclusion, to me, it's where everyone feels seen, heard, and valued, despite their background, culture, religion, sexual orientation, gender, or ability. They can be just who they are and be fully included or accepted. Thanks. Well, thank Back you. to you, James. Thank you very much, Melanie. Gerda, what does inclusion mean to you? For me, thank you, James. For me, inclusion means representation. Inclusion means that we see one another with compassion at the same level. There is no better than, there is no worse than. As we include one another, we know that we are able to see each and every person as they are. And there is no judgment. So inclusion for me is not only representation, it is also compassion and love. Back to you, James. Thank you very much, Gerda. Albert, what does inclusion mean to you? Inclusion for me is where everybody in a group setting has something different to offer. And it's the collective group not having an expectation of anybody to have to change themselves in order to fit in, but we just accept them for who they are at the end of the day. That's inclusion to me. Thank you very much, Albert. Next, we have Anne. Anne, what does inclusion mean to you? Any you mean. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Inclusion means uh, we come together with all the differences, but work uh, together so harmoniously and present as one. Just like when you are asking a question, like which colors you like the most. But actually, every colors have their uniqueness. But when they work together, we have lights. Right, we have light in our life. That's how all the colors work together. That's what inclusion to me. That's not, what a beautiful rainbow of colors and what they could mean to us. All right, Iqbal, what does inclusion mean to you? Inclusion to me means when somebody feels welcome, irrespective of their color, creed, sexual orientation, or any, any of the other things, free of biases, and uh, they feel welcome and free to express their opinions without any fear or concern. Thank you very much, Iqbal. And Mark Brown, could you please tell us what 
inclusion means to you. And you're on mute, I believe. Thank you. Inclusion means to me all together, we're all one. No one is better than the other. We share the same expectations and goals together just to, to be each other's neighbors, friends, and to make everybody feel included no matter what. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Krista, what does inclusion mean to you? Thank you. Inclusion means to me embracing differences, not only what you see, but also what you don't see. A lot of people are struggling beneath the surface in a lot of different ways, whether it's physically, mentally, or emotionally, and to have patience and empathy and to embrace those differences regardless is including the whole person. Well. Wow. Thank you very much, Krista. Yes, so much of our life is so visually impacted that sometimes we just uh, don't see it. We don't see, and we make our judgments based upon what we don't see. Wayne, finally, could you please tell us what inclusivity means to you? Absolutely, James. For me, inclusive really means getting a sense of belonging. Far too often in our society, we are put aside because of our differences, whether it's a disability, whether it's a, a different ethnic background. Sometimes society just really doesn't embrace that difference. And you're often left out of whether it be a sports event or whether it be employment or anything like that. But gaining that sense of belonging and being a part of the rest of society, because let's face it, we are no different, but we are the same. Back to you, James. Thank you very much, Wayne. And yes, it, it is wonderful when we can all be at the table together. When you had mentioned that, it just reminded me of a wonderful dinner or a company dinner and feeling an outcast. And then somebody invites you over and just feeling part of the group. And that's mm -hmm. just uh, being welcome at the table where everyone can enjoy. I, I think that's a beautiful picture you painted. Thank you. Now, the first batch of questions that I have for the panelists uh, are all related to lived experiences. And we're gonna go through a, a various sections, but this section is about lived experiences. And I have a question for Wayne and Greta. And it is, could you please tell us a time where you felt excluded are you asking me it, well it's for both you wayne and for greta so i don't know if you want to say ladies first or... oh, of course ladies first <laughs> <laughs> well thank you <laughs> thank you wayne and thank you james was there a time where i felt excluded well actually yes not too long ago as Many people were being invited. Their name was being called. We were on a Zoom call. And the, what we were supposed to do is that once we finish speaking, then we call on the next person and so on. And that's what that group did. And all this time I kept thinking, <laughs> when are they going to call my name? Even the people who, were, who I work with very closely, even the people who come by and stop by every morning to say good morning to me, they forgot. I was the last one called. And all this time I felt included, excluded. And I felt, how is it that those people come to me for advice, come to say hello, and none of them remember that I was there? And all this time I was thinking, <laughs> How am I going to, when it is my time, to show up without showing that I was hurt? It took a lot in me when I finally, <laughs> it was time for me to say something, to show up as I am and not as a hurt person. And here is my question to all. 
when what happened to George Floyd and you know someone who is black, you have a black friend, friend or friends, how many of you reach out to them? I know in my work, there was only one person who called to make sure that I was okay. Because I can tell you, we were all affected. So for me, that's what feeling excluded felt like. Back to you, James. Thank you very much, Carita. And it's, it's true, like it's something as being the last person called. I, I, I don't know about you, but I remember being on that soccer pitch when they're picking teams and everybody else is picked and you're the last one and it hurts, it, it hurts. Okay, Wayne, could you please tell us a time when you felt excluded? Yes, I, there's so many different times that I've felt excluded. Like you, James, being the last person picked on a team, um, believe it or not, I am vertically challenged. I'm all of five foot two and shrinking as we speak. But one of the, the, the episodes that stands out in my mind, in 2016, I decided to go after a, a, a childhood dream. I always wanted to be in a marching band. So I went to uh, Niagara Falls and auditioned to be in this marching band. And because they were an alumni group, a lot of these men and women that were in the band had been there since childhood and they reestablished the organization in the late nineties. So coming in, I was an outsider to begin with, but being blind, also meant being isolated. Sure, we would go through our rehearsals and whatnot and everything was fine during that aspect. But when we took breaks or at the end of the evening, we would go upstairs to the bar and often I would be sitting alone at a table. Nobody else would approach me. Whether it was fear, they didn't know how to speak to me or I really don't know, but it, it, I think that was one of the episodes that really stands out in my mind. I could be here for hours talking about other episodes, but uh, that one really, I think, was the epitome of standing alone. Mm -hmm. Back to you, James. Thank you very much, Wayne. Yes, that would be. I, I have to ask, in the marching band you didn't take on the big tuba did you that wasn't your instrument i hope no actually i played the bass drum the bass drum oh, okay yeah. well then, yeah. that's that's quite interesting i did that All for right. three years oh wow now i do encourage please everybody if you have questions please enter them into the chat uh, we have our zoom masters who are taking those in and we'll be uh coordinating the questions for the end. So please, I encourage you to enter in your questions. There are people that are waiting for you to enter them in. Now, my next question is for Krista and Albert. It is, was there a time where you were in a group and someone else in the group was excluded? What did you do about it? I can go ahead and answer that. Thank you very so much. So one of the things that I often do is I scan the room and I look for that person who's sitting alone. Uh, perhaps they want to sit alone if they're an introvert, but most times than not, they're not sure what they're supposed to be doing. Maybe they came alone. Maybe they came in a group. Maybe they're not as active or comfortable in mingling. So I actually make a point to go over, introduce myself, ask them their name. I think it's really important to help people feel seen and especially be addressed by their name, maybe come up with some conversation and just make them feel like they are part of that group, even though they may not be in the middle of it, that they have an ally in the room and that there is somebody that is supportive and safe and provides comfort and is a go-to so that they don't have to feel so alone. And I would say that's representative in 
any environment, any social situation. That's that's wonderful. That is uh, amazing. I'm sure Wayne's thinking, where were you in my, <laughs> in my marching band? So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Albert. So growing up, uh, I used to play hockey. And for several of those years, the te my team was essentially, it, it was the same group of guys. And so we already had this bond and we, we were already a tight knit group. And then there was one particular year where there was another team that didn't have enough players. And so they all had to spread out all over the league. And one of the players came to our team. So he was the new guy. And I noticed that at the beginning, he was sort of by himself and he started, he became isolated essentially from the group. And it became glaringly obvious because nobody was really interacting with him. So what I did was I tried to break the ice. And, you know, if I thought, you know, if I can get him socially included, just talking to him and that getting him to get to know at least one person, it would probably make him feel better, make him feel a little more comfortable because I imagined that it was an awkward situation for him, first of all, being around complete strangers. And then not only that, you don't know anybody, but then you don't have anybody socializing with you also added to that awkwardness and discomfort as well. And so I thought at least, you know, if you have somebody just so start that social conversation with that individual, it would make him feel a lot comfortable. And eventually throughout the season, things did improve for him. Eventually, we all came around afterwards, and he did feel a part of the team by the end. Well, that's that's incredible. And it's amazing how something so small could be so monumental in, in, in changing somebody's life. Thank you very much. Now, this next uh, question I have for Annie in Iqbal. Now, has there ever been a time when your pre preconceived stereotypes about your culture has made you react a certain way and why? Gentlemen's first. Gentlemen's first. <laughs> oh, okay. Age before beauty. I was going to go to the other way. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, there have been uh, many instances. Uh, you know, I came into this country as an immigrant coming from India and all that, there are certain names that people call them. Uh, you might have heard the term Paki. When I came into this country earlier on, I didn't know what it meant. And being new in the country, didn't have a car or anything. I used to walk to bus stops, take bus and all, all that. And you, you will come across a wide group of kids and they start laughing at you. They start calling you names. And that kind of really put me down to the extent that even when I got into work environment, it took me a while to get my self-confidence back. So you start thinking about you are something, there's something missing in you, you're inferior uh, in certain aspects, even being well-educated coming from my own country. After some time, my English, spoken English was fluent enough to carry on conversation and all that. But internally I felt like I'm, I'm not up to par with these people. So I, I used to hold myself back. Those stereotypes then kind of start impacting your self-confidence. That's where it becomes really dangerous because then you become introvert, you start staying away from things that you could be part of and contribute to. And those are the things that I think we need to be very careful about and watch out for. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. You, you, you can't be 100% yourself. And thank you, Iqbal. Annie. 
Yes, sure. Uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, culture uh, difference from the country that I, I, I grew up, I was educated uh, uh, and with the country that I'm living in right now, right? But some of you, you could figure out that I, I, I was uh, from China, immigrated to Canada in year 2000. And he, like in Canada, we often heard that you don't talk to a stranger, right? But back in China, when I was a little girl, my mom told me just don't talk too much at all. Because <laughs> that's a leadership sort of thing, right? Like in China, in the traditional culture, uh, ladies supposed to be very graceful and you need to reserve your opinion and only say things in a appropriate way, in appropriate occasion. And like you behave yourself the best way you can, usually like a lot respectful to people around you. And one of the things like you don't even smile with your teeth showing up, <laughs> things like that, like I'm not doing it right now. But a lot of traditional culture uh, was there in the education or in, in my parents' mind uh, that they believe is the right thing to do, is the right way to bring me up. But like then I realized that those uh, um, are having a big impact in my life. Although now I'm living here in Canada with a lot of freedom in my hands to do things the way I like, but I am still influenced this way or another by uh, the culture background and education background. And now in my career world, uh, I often host meetings with my client and with my teammates. And we do have a lot of people like to talk, right? They are very extrovert and they document, they dominate most of the time to talk. But for me, because my background, I'd like to get the things done and rather like talking about it, right? I'd like to just get it all over and present the result. This is what I did. Everything's good, no problem. I, I don't like to talk about it, but I think it, in the long run, that would be disadvantaged when you considering the team collaboration, communication, the effectiveness of teamwork. So I started to try to overcome my cultural background and just come up to talk, to express my opinion and uh, ideas even without all, all of those uh, self-consideration all of those uh, assessment inside of me uh, i felt that's a very uh important thing for me to get a, get along in the uh, life here and to build a better relationship with uh, my team and people around me so that's part of overcoming my culture background and also a little bit of introversion from my personality as well Okay. Well, thank you very much, Annie. That is that is very good. Now, my final question is for Mark and Melanie, which is, when was the first time in your life you discovered that inclusion mattered? Who would you like to go first, James? Um, Mark, would you like to? Thank you. I realized inclusion mattered from a very young age because I was the one that was being excluded. And being new to a country, being new to a school, a classroom, you were never the first person they would pick. They were, you weren't the one that they were gonna go to pretty much for anything because one, I spoke differently. So one, they couldn't understand me. So why would they include me? So for me, I tried to fit in, but because of one, the language barrier, it, it wasn't received well. And transferring to different schools because you had to move out of the, out of the district or your family got a new job in another area. So you had to start over. So I never got to be a part of any one particular group. I tried to basically 
for my own group with myself to try to be cool, but I always felt alone and isolated because nobody did what, what Crystal would do. Nobody would reach out to me, that lone person. So I had to do it for myself in, in, in my own way. And eventually decided to make friends or force my friendship onto people. But I was very fortunate that the people that I approached to be friends with were genuinely good people. Mm-hmm. They welcomed me in. I didn't feel excluded anymore. I kind of sort of started to feel like I belonged. And it's not easy coming from another country, speaking somewhat of a different language, broken English, where people chose not to listen to you, chose not to welcome you. But as I grew into the culture, I made sure that anybody that was new, I made their friendship. I became their friend and let them feel included no matter what it was that we were doing. So I learned from a young age that inclusion is very important to feel accepted, no matter how different you are. So thank you. Very good. Yes, I I think, well, thank you. So you became the Krista uh, that you like. Excellent. Melanie. I love listening to everybody's different perspectives. For me, growing up, I thought everybody was the same. Everybody was equal. My family raised me that way. It wasn't until I acquired my disability when I was 21, when I really truly understand what inclusion meant because I was excluded. I was looked at differently because I was that disabled girl now. (gasps) My friends, they felt they didn't know how to be around me anymore. My family, everybody started to treat me differently. And I truly understood what it felt like to be excluded from groups of people, friends, family, the workplace. And this is when I understood the importance to learn to advocate for yourself, to help others feel included so that they understood that you too were just like them, maybe did things a little bit differently, but the importance of everyone being heard, seen, and valued. And I couldn't believe, looking back and reflecting, that how, as a child, we don't see that everybody's not the same. We know there's different things and we, we and different people have different backgrounds and cultures, but we were just so innocent. So I really felt as we grow older, we pick up those stereotypes and those misconceptions through society and other people's beliefs. So I'm very curious to hear what other people, when that happened to them, because for me, it wasn't until I was in my twenties and that is mind boggling in so many ways. Thanks, James. Thank you very much, Melody. And yeah, sometimes it's it's not until you lose something that you realize, oh, that's what I had. Uh, like you you were inclusive and, and, and to appreciate what you had. That's excellent. So now we're going to move into another section. And this section is, but what do we learn about ourselves? Okay. And for this first group of questions, it's going to be a three, three people. So actually four, Melanie, Albert, Krista, and Gerda. Now you can all fight for a poll position. Whoever wants to answer it first, go ahead. But it is in your different experiences, whether being included or not, what have you learned about yourself? In your different experiences, whether being included or not, what have you learned about yourself? I will go. Thank you, Gerda. (laughs) You're welcome. What I have learned about myself is that I am versatile that I am comfortable in my own skin wherever I am, that I am very introspective so that in, at every moment, I pay attention to what my body is telling me as well as paying attention to what people around me are telling me. Because of that, I communicate on a very different level with everyone, because not only I hear what people are not saying, (laughs) I also read what their face (laughs) is saying, what their gestures are telling me. I've learned to listen so actively. 
that I am surprised at myself. <laughs> so this is what I have learned about myself, being included or excluded. Back to you, James. Thank you very much, Gerda. Who would like to go next? Albert. I'm just going to go girl boy, girl boy. Sure. So in my experiences, so what have I learned about myself? Well, probably the main thing that I've learned about myself is that, you know, I always thought when, when I was growing up that, you know, I, I used to be more close-minded and I didn't, I didn't like to try something new, but throughout these experiences, slowly I've evolved into somebody who has become more open-minded and it's, it was subtle <laughs> and something that I didn't notice at all because I always thought of myself as being more close, more of a close-minded type person. But as I do reflect, uh, as I get older and look back a little bit, uh, there's an evolution that happens throughout life and through your experiences going through it and taking all the lessons all along the way. And I was a lot more open-minded than I thought was possible <laughs> from my younger self. And that's what I've learned about myself through my experiences. Okay, thank you very much. Albert. Like I, I, and just as a polling the panelists by raising your hand, who here has said that, you know what, I had to evolve and grown for greatly different? Okay, mm -hmm. I think it's unanimous. Yes, excellent. All right, uh, Krista, Yeah. would love to hear from you. So what I've come to realize is I'm definitely more resilient that I gave myself credit for. And I've also had to learn to not take things personally. I think that how people were reacting around me, I used to take that personally. Maybe I needed to change who I was, maybe change what I did, change what I put out into the world. And although that could be true on some levels, I started to recognize that the biases and the experiences and the projection that was coming from other people didn't have anything to do with me. So I had to stop taking that personally. One of the examples that I often use to help people understand how you can have good intentions and empathy, but not really understand what somebody's going through unless you're that person is the notion of a man having a baby. So a man can know what it's, you know, they can see what's going on, they can appreciate, maybe the struggle what's going on they can have empathy and have good intentions and do anything that they can to make that situation better but they will never actually be able to experience having a baby so i've learned in that framework not to take things personally that it's really someone sharing and supporting through their own experiences that are going that's going to uh, create that interaction with myself. That is that is incredible. Sorry, I, I, I laughed there because I remember for our second child, for the first child, we we're going all natural and everything like that. And then we always wanted to do there was no uh, epidural per se. And then when we were having the second child or talking to the doctor wife goes in and I said oh we're not having an epidural and then she was like um I'm having an epidural <laughs> there is no way. so it just has to yeah guys we don't know we have yeah. no clue like I see it and I applaud you that is an amazing miracle that women do so it really helped James just to like to end that it really helped me in dealing with my own anger and resentment and as much as I wanted to be included I also had to include back you know what other people experiences were as well so it, it really helped my perspective open up a little bit that it wasn't just about me it was that it was that shared interaction and and yeah. having that mutual respect come in the middle. Yes. Well, that is that is awesome. Okay. And I have Melanie as, as my last yes. one. Okay. Thanks, James. So for me, it's actually embarrassing, I'll be honest. 
prior to acquiring my disability, I was that person that would see somebody in a wheelchair and cross the street because I didn't know how to deal with it. Or the first day I went to the CNIB to learn how to live my life as a blind person, I was like, do I look them in the eyes? <gasps> I was uneducated and uninformed about people with disabilities. I saw the disability and I didn't see the person. So what I learned about myself over the time when it happened to me, I used to joke, oh, karma, Melanie, <laughs> you were ignorant and now look what happened. But no, it's just that people don't know what they don't know. If they've never experienced it. That's no excuse for rudeness or, or treating anybody differently. What it is, is that we have to listen to other people's lived experiences if we have never experienced it. Put ourselves in their shoes just for a day. We may not get the full effect, but ask questions and learn and educate ourselves to understand other people's situations. I've also learned that I, as I learned how to cope with my disabilities, that I too wanted to help educate others and share my experiences so that they didn't have to ask those uncomfortable questions that they weren't sure about. So when a child comes up and says, what's that stick? And the parents drag them away, because oh, you shouldn't talk to her because she's disabled or you know whatever that you might catch it by educating the, these kids and letting them know that this helps me get around this is actually my eyes it helps me be independent they're open to learning and wanting to ask more so just by being more open and educating and sharing my lived experience will help me help others not be who i was before mm -hmm. so that's what i learned about myself back to you james Thank you, Melanie. And I, and I think it's interesting that, like you said, like with the child asking simply, what's that stick? That is a perfectly honest and acceptable question, whereas the, what the parent's response is unacceptable, which is, is kind of funny. The child was actually acting the way they should, we should. So um, just asking the question and trying to find out and being inquisitive and not just wanting to know. Um, okay, next question I have is for Annie. Iqbal, Mark, and Wayne. What have you learned about the people that are close to you? Okay. Very quiet. <laughs> Thank okay. you, James. Thank uh, you. What I have learned about people who are close to me. Well, I have learned that everyone has a tough life, <laughs> especially now we're in the COVID, right? And I know everyone here on this panelist and uh, all the audience, they are putting up their energy and they're smiling, but doesn't mean that they are living a beautiful, perfect life, right? We're going up and down in this journey. That's almost the natural part of our this, this uh, time that given to us, granted to us. And everyone on some certain point of their life facing difficulties. And there's a lot of things coming from the outside world. There's a lot of things coming from the inside world that disturbing us. So when we go into a situation interacting with other people, like sometimes we feel excluded, right? We don't feel the, the, the level of inclusion that we expect to see and a lot of time that's because of the timing of the person of the people and maybe we are not in the best shape to understand to be more uh, empathetic about the situation maybe they are in a bad time not giving their full heart to to the surroundings as well or maybe we're just different and there are some gap of lack of understanding like um, Krishna and uh, Wayne mentioned before, like due to the disability, we may live a completely different type of life. Then if Wayne's sitting there, then I how like I would ask the question, how would I approach? How would I make the first uh, question to him? So he will feel welcome and we not, I'm not gonna offend him or anything. So there, there will be more concern from, from my side but my behavior of hesita hesitation may be uh, interpreted into a different way from his side. So I think there's a complex situation when we talk about inclusion, where there, there are almost like two doors on both sides. We need to take the courage to step out 
in order to find out more about the other side. Like, it doesn't matter what we learn about the people around us, it's the attitude of continual learning about people around us in the very positive mindset. That's very true. Thank you. Yeah, it, it is a two way street and just understanding uh, everything. All right. Uh, Iqbal, love to hear. What have you learned about the Thank people that are close to you? I, I will share uh, one experience that uh, I went through a uh, couple of years back when my son was quite young. At that time, we were living in Scarborough and we were starting to look for a new home uh, where we wanted to move to. And we started looking more. There was some development happening uh, in the east and close to the lake. We thought that would be a kind of great location close to the water and so on and so forth. And then we were almost ready to sign up. And then one of my friends came by and said, you know, do you realize what you are doing? You are going to a neighborhood which where you will be a very small minority. And you have a young child who is going to go to school and going to go to the, the experiences there. You better reconsider. And at that time, yeah, the, we meant the best for my son. And so we changed our mind and we ended up moving to Mississauga. And then a couple of years later, we ended up moving to Brampton, even to be more among a population where our community was more in the majority. And at that time, what I realized that I, we all have our own biases that we have to be very, very careful about. In my family, everybody was happy. Oh, our son is in, in a class where a majority of the kids are from our own community and all that. And then all of a sudden, like the people who are a Canadian majority, now they are in a minority, they're happy for that. That's what it kind of really hit me in the sense that now we don't want to come because we are in the majority, we don't want to become the other way around. That's now the people who are in minority kind of start experiencing those yeah. same things that we experience when yes. we are in minority, right? So yeah. that, that really kind of hit, brought home acknowledgement that we all have our own biases that we have to be very, very open and careful about. That is that is very true, and, and the, the the danger of those who are the visible minority then once they get majority treat yeah. the other minority the way they didn't want to be treated, yeah. and, and exactly. that's a yeah very good point. Uh, I have Mark and Wayne, who's going to go to answer that next question. What have you learned about those who are close to you? I guess I'll go next. Okay, thank you very much, Wayne. Obviously, my mic's on. <laughs> Yes. yes. <laughs> I wasn't sure at the point. So uh, what I've learned about uh, people around me is uh, I, I'm a very independent person. So I will try anything once. And for me, it, it's really hard to explain to whether it's neighbors or, or family, friends that, that I do just about anything. I cut my own grass. I was taught by someone who was totally blind. Uh, I, I use the snow blower in the winter time. I'm the only person on the street. If I choose to cut my grass at 10 o'clock at night, I can do that. So it, it's really interesting that some of the odd comments that I've received, mostly from outsiders, whether they be neighbors or whatnot, they'll challenge me and they'll say, well, you obviously can see more than you let on. Or I've had one person say, why are you pretending to be blind? <laughs> or my favorite one is, you don't look blind. And my reply is, you don't look stupid. 
So the whole thing is, if I took off my blind uniform, obviously I don't look blind, but there's a reason why I wear the uniform, whether it's a white cane or a guide dog, but it's interesting that people will ignore you when you're using a white cane. But when you have a guide dog, it's like flies to honey. <laughs> people swarm around you. They want to ask questions. They don't ask questions about your disability. They ask questions about your dog. And the reason that is because everyone has either owned a dog or has known somebody who's had a dog. So there's a, an obvious question or conversation that they can have with you and not feel uncomfortable. But I think that the, the biggest thing that I've learned, especially in my family, is because I'm so independent, they just treat me normal. My wife, we've been married 33 years, and she's still to this day after me to hang up my power tools. So I just wait until she leaves. So she doesn't have to worry about it. I still have 10 fingers. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's odd sometimes. It's a, it's a two-way street, whether it's that people exclude you or whether they, they don't believe that, that you have this non-visible disability. So back to you, James. Thank you very much, Wayne. I, I think that's pretty amazing that your neighbors don't believe it. And I'm thinking at first I was picturing a snow blown driveway that was zigzagging all over the place, but now I'm thinking it's probably pristine and cleaner than anybody else's. Yeah. And yeah. I'm thinking you might be, you must be lying. So, yeah. okay. It's uh, called Mark. adaptability. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, what have you learned about the people that are close to you? What I've learned about the people closest to me is that they're resilient, they're survivors. There are people that are like myself and people that I've always wanted to be like. Now for many, for a lot part of my life, it hasn't been what I would call good. I wasn't surrounded by good people. Worse off after I had my accident, I was taken advantage of. And not just by strangers, but by family members oh. who took it upon themselves to take what wasn't theirs or thought that I didn't need any of it. Because here I am now, a quadriplegic, my life was over. And those were people that cared about me and they, they didn't want what was right for me. But the people that really did was a very small group of people and they taught me to be resilient. They taught me how to be a survivor. And that for me gave me a lot of empowerment. It gave me a lot of strength. Now, for a very long period of time after my injury, I went through the whole ups and downs of depression, anxiety, all of that medication abuse, not because I did it myself, just because it was just all too strong and all too fast. Um, I came upon an organization, Connect for Life, um, which you all know is Melanie Sting. And from getting to know Melanie, a person that was visually impaired, which to me, I didn't notice. She is so strong. She's so capable. She makes literally being blind so easy. And through her, the people that she was around, it, it drew me in. It gave me my strength, my own my own strength to be independent and to be more trustworthy. And I, I mean, I've met more people that's been good to me in the disability community that I had prior to my disability. 
I've learned so much from them that I myself have become empowered to go that extra step and to not volunteer my time, just give my time to whatever it asks of me to help other people. Because those people have reached out and helped me mm -hmm. grow as a person and to reach out and to see so much more that I've never seen before. And I must say that I'm proud to, uh, to know all of these people, to gain this experience because it's better me. It allows me to be a voice to people with disabilities that, that can't speak up for themselves and who have been hurt. So I gain my, my independence, my trustworthy, my values to Melanie, to the people that she has brought into my life that has taught me to be I would say a top-notch individual. I'm learning so much each and every day from Toastmasters, the people in Toastmasters, their lived experience, the people through Connect for Life, through the various disabilities, I have now grown to, to love as a person. So that's great. I've learned so much and I can only gain more. And this is something that I look forward to. I'm much more trustworthy than I was many years ago. Well, Thank you. that's understandable. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, sorry, I, I, moving on to the next section, we're going to be looking at solutions implementations, looking at ways of coming up with solutions. So uh, first question is going to be for Albert and Krista which is what's one thing that you have developed in your life to help people feel more included? Now, Krista, you've already sort of talked as a bit about this and, uh, and, you know, maybe, maybe if you could just expand on it, like, is it a concept that you just actively do whenever you go into an environment? Like what are the things that you do? I think in the concept of projection, Oh, Sorry, am I unmuted? No, you're 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 talking now. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, for solutions, and I think a lot of us have talked about perception and biases and projection and that sort of thing of how other people see us. And what's interesting, so I I started to experience massive disabilities on many levels at the age of 29. So I went to bed perfectly fine, athletic and mobile. Uh, one night, woke up the next morning completely disabled with the onset of severe rheumatoid arthritis, which I've now had for 22 years. So it's affected every facet of life, mentally, emotionally, physically, work, social relationships, parenting, the gamut. And what's really interesting is that when somebody is experiencing different struggles, they themselves don't know what they need. So when somebody, it's twofold, somebody who has understanding can maybe help you with their experience and what they think can help you. But I think the other thing that I've learned that's really important is to ask people what they need. So to not always assume this is what you need. This is what I think will help you. This is how this is what's going to fix you. We don't need fixing. Sometimes we just need understanding and some patience. And sometimes we don't know what we need. Sometimes we just need to be believed. So I think it's really important that people say, how can I support you? and have that conversation and not always have an action that is associated with something. I think presence sometimes speaks more in volume than actually trying to fix things all the time. And to just be there and to have that respect and empathy, I think goes a long way. Yeah, well, thank you, Chris, because I, I think that's, I don't, I know there's times when it's just nice to have a friend to be there 
right? It's not, don't, don't fix, just, I just want somebody to be with me, right? And I guess that's what you're, you're getting at. It, it's just not the, uh, you know, I, I know, and we take a look at Melanie, she can do everything. So it's like, it's like, why, why try to do something? She, she could do it. She could probably cut the lawn better than Wayne. So, uh, <laughs> but I mean, like, but having somebody there to just be and listen and be a friend, I think is, yeah, as he says. Is well, and if, if somebody perceives what your challenges are, they may also set the bar lower than what you're capable of. So we want to make sure that, you know, we're also advocating for ourselves and having that conversation so that, you know, if you need something, you can say it and, you know, you're always striving to be your best, no matter what the invisible or visible challenge may be. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen. And Albert, what's the thing that you've developed in your life to help people feel more included? This is in terms of my, my work could be uh, the best example here. And... So in my role at work, I manage teams. I manage a team of employees. And sometimes we always get somebody new coming in to the team once in a while. And what I found that works to really integrate them into the whole team, gain familiarity for somebody that's new, is that I try to get to know them right away, get to know something about them not in terms of the work environment, but on a personal level, getting to know them as a person. And when you do that, I notice is, what I notice is sometimes you do hit on something that's common between the two of you through having conversations. And once that happens, I mean, that's where things really take off is when you hit that point of commonality, because at the end of the day, yes, everybody is different and we're all our own individuals, but we do have so much more in common than you might think. And so once that happens, that's that point where that individual who probably came in as an outsider starts to really feel like more of on the inside as well, because then that's where the comfort level starts to change and, and everything. And then that's when they start to feel more familiar with their environment. And, and so just getting to know somebody and see, well, where can you hit on each other in terms of something that's common, like a common shared experience and whatnot. That, that is excellent. Yeah. Cause we all speak different languages and, and uh, it could be French, German, or it could be also I'm a Dungeons and Dungeons Dragons master. And you know what I mean? we all have different languages and all of a sudden, if that's the thing that clicks, right. And then, yeah, I, I think that's, that is awesome. Excellent. So my next one's for Wayne and Melanie. What's the one thing in your opinion you think we're missing a solution to? Melanie, go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Wayne, and thank you, James. So for me, what it is, is everybody has the best of intentions and they do what they think is right. So I'm gonna use the example of policies or statements that people put like the dis, the discrim, anti-discrimination or the accessibility uh, mandate and policy or even the diversity and inclusion policies that companies think or know they need to have because people will complain if there isn't one in place but the solution is great intention great starting point but they need to have people with lived experiences that actually live it on a daily basis leading these projects and ensuring there are ways to make sure that there's ways to follow up. The AODA, the, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act is a prime example. They've got these standards that everybody in Ontario to make Ontario more accessible for by 2025, but nobody is keeping people accountable. So if they're not following these policies and standards, nobody's there. But if you had put together a team of individuals with disabilities that live this on a daily basis to follow up and ensure that people are following these and giving them reasons why it's important, I think it would be much more successful. The same with diversity and inclusion policies. If you have people from different backgrounds and cultures that live with the racism, that lived with the biases, they can bring their experiences to the table and help make this policy more realistic, more 
as a point that people have to understand. And I find that people higher up in the companies may not have those perspectives or those lived experiences to bring to the table. So that just shows that the solutions may be started, but they're not getting fully fulfilled because we're not bringing the right people in to follow through and making those actionable items. Back to you, James. Thank you very much, Melanie. Yes. And uh, Wayne, same question. Well, since Melanie said everything, I, I really don't need to add. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, seriously, the, the, the one thing is, is, is action. It's all well and fine to put these policies in place, but if there's no action or inaction, it just continues on and on and on. I'm a very optimistic person, but sometimes I get very pessimistic because sometimes in our society, there are things that we want to change, but we can't. And I hate that word. I hate using the word can't. But the simple fact is that we can build the physical ramps, but we need to build the ramps to the mind. Far too often, we've got this discrimination, whether it's, it's ethnic discrimination, whether it's discrimination against disabilities. There are people that have inherited this discrimination. They've been brought up in that environment and continues ages after ages. But that where the solution lies, I don't know. It's a very complex situation because there are, are situations where there is no changing people's minds. So we have to figure out how do we get rid of it? Back to you, James. That's a very good question is how do you get rid of it? Because like, I mean, there was, slavery was banished years years and years ago and the Emancipation Proclamation was made. But as you said, there's, uh, it's written in the halls in the government, but it's not written in the minds of men. And it takes years for that to be rewritten and that people begin to see things. And yeah, it's a quite, that's a great question. How do we do that? And that's yeah. like, how, how do you make it happen? And I think as Melanie, you said, there's sometimes it's gonna be people in the right spots that all of a sudden see it and say, no, we have to make this change. Um, like if, for example, if you, as you said, there could be a president of Loblaws, if all of a sudden their spouse has a mass, massive stroke and they can't see, they can't do other things, all of a sudden they're going to notice that store doesn't have a rant. This doesn't have this. Then we just become a, apparently invisible to it. So, or it becomes obvious to us. So it's, uh, yeah, action needs to happen. Unfortunately, words are very empty, right, Wayne? And Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, Guerda and Iqbal, how can you educate others to be more inclusive? How can we educate others to be more inclusive? Iqbal, I'll, I'll ask you to go first. And... All right. Thank you. Thank you, James. I think we have to basically educate other people about acknowledging our biases. And one thing that I really, really uh, caution people about is that whatever solutions, implementations we come up with, they are not just done because that is the bird, like the bird of the day kind of thing. Because what, if you look back for the last two, three years, what has happened? Me Too movement started, media picked it up, on it, everybody was talking about it. All the businesses, everybody was coming out with the statements to kind of look like they, they fully support it and all that, and then that kind of dies down. We don't talk about it as much now. Then the George Floyd thing incident happened last year. We were talking about black racism and all that for some time, then it starts to die down. Now, residential school things has come up. Now we're talking about indigenous uh, discrimination against indigenous people. Again, like those kind of things, they get picked on and people talk about it. Some meaningful change happens, 
don't get me wrong by when, when these things come up to the surface it makes people aware more people get educated about it but the key thing is to have more sustainable change mm-hmm. yeah. and that sustainable change is not a one time thing that will happen it, it's a continuous awareness continuous educating continuously watching even our own selves against those things to kind of kind of continue on this path it's a journey it's not a one time yes. thank you thank you very much and gerda i totally agree with what igbal said and as i was listening to igbal i thought do you understand and i'm saying you i'm saying everyone if, including myself do we understand why nelson mandela led the restoration project in his country which was people who had done something that was terrible they had to come in front of the family members to say what they had done and ask for forgiveness if not they would not receive it and when i read about it this is what it told me it's not about education because education only affects the mind it is about the people have to experience it in order for them to understand it it is it's one thing to say i am sorry it's another thing to say i am sorry because what i have done i know what it did to you and because of that i know how it affected me because we are connected and because of that i will no longer do that because nowadays we say sorry all the time oh i'm sorry i step on your foot oh i'm sorry i hit you oh i'm sorry and then we st- we we do this again for me sorry without change behaviors is lip service and i think it's time for us to stop giving lip service and put some action into what we are saying so how do we educate i don't know but i know that it needs to be thought heart actions if not we will continue to talk about things for 2 3 years and then forget forget about them and then it will come back again and again and again and again because to tell you the truth what happened to george floyd should not have happened because we've experienced it before so for me definitely the education needs to happen in many different ways for people to come and say this is what i have done this is what i have realized and this is what i will no longer do back to you James. thank you very much and that is a a very beautiful point that it, it's uh sorry doesn't necessarily mean anything or there's a difference between apologizing and being repentant in which repentant means i've turned and i will no longer go down that path again um so it it's uh yeah it's a very very good point and i i think we have come some way i know that for example for education i don't know about you i know when i was going to school they never talked about residential schools um it was not a thing uh and meanwhile my daughter educates me and she tells about it and how the atrocities are and like i feel horrible about the whole thing but it the fact that she knew about it and she knew about the atrocities i, th- I think there was a positive turn there is education that is happening and she just knows it's just not right and and she i guess she put herself in the in that concept in that reality as to what would it be like for her and and it was like it it, it will not happen again so uh final question for this section is was there a solution that was implemented for inclusion but ended up having the opposite result or became offensive uh this is for Annie and Mark an incident that was intended to be inclusive but ended up being 
the opposite. Do you know of anything? If not, and other panelists, is something's popping to your mind and you're just like, oh, me, me, <laughs> please. Well, um, I think um, I'm not gonna talk about it, but it could be a little bit controversial though. Um, let's talk about the uh, feminist activities. Right. We wanted to have women being included into the uh, career world, in the business world. We wanted to see more uh, women involved into high rank business management. And we wanted to see more women present in the political world. Right? We wanted to uh, hear their voice and see them weighed in with their uh, opinions and suggestions. Well, I think it's a fantastic um, uh, intention to do that. But on the other hand, I wanted to say that women has a way, uh, has a significant role in family, right? Uh, that shouldn't be in, uh, weighed off against the, the role that in, in, in the business world, in the political world or whatsoever. Just have a quality, high quality, um, uh, mom, like I did not say high quality, but a mom uh, with a material way to dealing with family relationships, uh, the material way to educate their children and sometimes even educate their spouse could be very, very important. Uh, within the family, it should be uh, centralized by the role of a mom, of a wife because woman has this particular nature of soothing everything off. Well, it could be very aggressive, the word outside, but when people coming back to home, it, woman playing a very important role there to keep things in harmony, not just for the smaller scope of the family, but in the extended family tree and family range and to keep things moving along. And the other thing is the education of our children. If a woman has good education themselves and self-education and uh, involvement of their awareness of all the issues we're talking about, then they can pass it down to their children so it won't happen again in the next generation or next, next generation. So for a woman to stay at home is to choose to stay at home and to pick on that role and fulfill their role in the best way they can, can be even more important than they go out to make a different influence. I'm not saying the other way is not important, but either way, it should be a, a solid choice for a woman to choose. It shouldn't be discriminated or uh, exclusive, exclusive for either way when, make, when either like women pick on either path to go down to achieve big things in their life. Thank you very much. That is a very poignant question. And often, yes, is if a woman is in a group of people and they say, oh, I'm look after the kid, it's almost sometimes they're discounted and they're a leper and they're not considered a part of the group. And meanwhile, the family unit is the core of society. Without a good family unit, our society falls apart. So, and at the backbone of the family unit is the mother. Like, God bless my mother. I love her to pieces, and I know every mom. And I, my hats off. And I think the world agrees because Mother's Day, it kicks Father's hey. Day's butt. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, Okay. Now, uh, Annie, now, I have a question, Annie, or sorry, have, Annie, it's for the group. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Okay, it is, we haven't received any questions from the group. So if you do have some questions, it is going to be open up uh, later on. So please enter them into the chat. Any of the questions that we've touched on or any of the topics that we've touched on, please enter it into the chat. We will be opening it up to open discussion later on. So, uh, Mark. James? Yes. Can I add something, please? Absolutely, Gerda. <laughs> okay, so when I, what I noticed, so in terms of the question, what was implemented for inclusion that had the opposite effect or result or became offensive? And having heard Annie's answer, I feel that 
as long as we keep thinking it's only one group that needs to do the work, we are missing the point. Everyone needs to be included in inclusion. <laughs> so what do I mean by that? If I think that, okay, so now that I've done anything wrong, it's only my part to change, then we're leaving some people out. For example, I come from Haiti and most people, when they hear I come from Haiti, they say, oh, Haiti, what a poor country. I don't know if it's that voice, but that's the way I, I hear it. <laughs> and then they proceed to tell me, oh, my aunt, oh, my brother, somebody went and did some work. And I'm thinking, really, I don't care. <laughs> okay, <laughs> seriously, I don't care. Why are you saying something like that to me when me hearing that you went to do some work making me feel not as valued? Why? So for me, the question is, if we are going to do work in inclusion, we really do need to include everyone so that no one feel that they are better than, because you know, I went to do some work in your country, <laughs> and that I feel lesser than, that, oh, I need to always have someone who's going to come and help me. It needs to be equal so that we understand that each of us, what we bring to the table is valuable. As long as we do not understand this, what has happened will continue to happen. Inclusion does not affect only the person who's hurting. It affects the people who have done the hurt. Because once you know that you were not, you were not truthful, then you start thinking that everybody else is like you. And then now you start living in fear. <laughs> so that's why it is important to understand this. What you put out will come to light. And inclusion is like this, not like this, not like this like this back to you it's, it's a so i gather you're saying is it's an even playing field nobody is above anybody else it's it's all on the same level and we're respecting each other and loving each other as such and whether that's correct okay excellent so we're going to move on to the next questions and then what i'm going to do uh mark is i'm going to throw you in there first if that's okay what do you think organizations can do to be more inclusive? Inclusive. Well, I think they first need to do is to be educated on what it is they're trying to accomplish. So they know what it is they have to do, who has to be involved, and who the right um, sources are and not to just try to do something to make the company look good, but to be honest with themselves mm -hmm. and to make sure that the people or the group that they're trying to reach is really reached. Involve them in the actual decision-making process. Something going back to the um, residential school, somebody thought that was a good idea. Somebody sat down and said, let's do this. But in actuality, it wasn't the right move on many levels. And here, and here we are today, hearing about it and trying to make, make it better somehow by throwing money at it. So organizations, they do have to know what it is they're trying to accomplish. And they have to start off by involving the right people to make sure that it gets the right, the right message out. And nothing is misconstrued. Nobody can come back a hundred years later and say, we should have done it this way. Take into consideration what the final 
outcome should be and go about it that the right way. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think we've said that earlier and that it's, you need to involve the right people. It's, uh, it's kind of like getting uh, someone who's French to teach the Spanish class and they don't know like a Spanish. It just it doesn't make sense. So, okay. So uh, I understand we are, okay, we have room for another one. Anybody else who would like to add to that question from the panel? Krista. Can I, sorry. sorry. This is for organizations, correct? Correct, yes. Okay, so this is really near and dear for me because if it wasn't for a manager and my team in the organization I worked for having an inclusive mindset, I wouldn't have had a career for 15 years uh, post disability and diagnosis. So I think they recognized that there, that difference and that different needs can still be rewarding. So I worked in an office that required me to go in every day and at the best of times early on in diagnosis, I couldn't get dressed. I couldn't bend my fingers to write. There was a lot that I couldn't do and it was recognized that if there was an accommodation that I could maybe work from home or do things differently and still meet my deliverables, that I could still be a contributing member to that group. So they they saw the talent and they saw the productivity and they saw the contribution that I was able to make by, by including me as opposed to excluding me because of what they saw or perceived I couldn't do. So even though I couldn't necessarily put shoes on to go into the office, I could put on a headset straight fingered and type like a boss and still manage global teams. So it became a very mutually benefit beneficial um, type of experience. I would say overall, creating an inclusive culture is really important. It does start from the top down because that trickles into HR, into team leads, and then how people function and operate and respect difference in general. It retains talent. It improves morale and creates trust along the employee base. And it also has less absenteeism and challenges from an HR perspective or any type of perceived disability where many people who have differences in abilities would be shuttled to. So I would say from an organi organizational perspective, definitely embrace differences, understand that the person isn't what, you know, individual or perceived struggles may be, there is so much more mind share and ability and talent that you could be, I don't want to say capitalizing on because that sounds terrible, but from a, from a company perspective, you know, use it or you're going to lose it and that person is going to go somewhere else where someone else is going to value their contribution. Yes, that is very true. And first off, I have to say, your manager for seeing it and taking uh, it, uh, well, taking advantage of you could be one thing. <laughs> oh, gosh, no. <laughs> but, 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 no not, the, not that way. I meant like, he was just, he was your No, I know, I know, I'm teasing. Work and, then, and, and grow. And it's just a matter of that's a, it's, it's scary to think the genius that has been lost the the where our society could possibly be today because people said oh they can't do it they're 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 not the right color they're they're, they're from india or someplace else and, they, and they're just discredited or they're physically blind they can't see like they're just not given the opportunity and you know we could be light years ahead of where we are if, if we just took advantage of it so that's a beautiful Beautiful example. So we have some questions from the floor. Our moderator, or not our moderators, but uh, do we have a question, Ryan, David? Yes, we do. Um, David, do you want to read the first question? Mm -hmm. 
the the first question that I have from the audience is from Gabby, and it asks, "What advice do you have for someone that notices discrimination in the workplace, but they are afraid to speak up for fear of losing their job?" <laughs> Pick me. Okay, Wayne. <laughs> you had the instant reaction. Oh, at the, oh at, that question just irks me to no end. I don't know how many times I have heard that in, in our society. There are so many companies out there that instill this fear factor in someone, whether they're, they have a, a, a disability or not. The thing that I always tell people is, go to your human resources, talk to the human resources and explain the situation. And if you don't get anywhere with that, take it to a disability lawyer. That's what they're there for because we are protected under the law and don't be afraid because they can't get rid of you because of your disability. I worked for a number of years right on the Toronto Stock Exchange and back then I had a lot more vision than I did then. I was afraid at first, but I became a pioneer for this company. I was the very first person with a known disability that they went out and accommodated me and got the equipment that I needed and I deserved. So again, just don't be afraid to, to let that information out but make sure you take it to the right people. Well, thank you. Anybody else who, I saw a few reactions that were instantaneous there. Uh, Guerta, I saw you uh, get riled up. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I tried to rein myself back. Well, yes, okay. you, you did, you, you, you cast that beautiful <laughs> smile, but I can still see it. I can still see it. <laughs> <laughs> so here is my, my take on this, because, you know, when someone is afraid, someone is afraid. <laughs> First of all, what is the fear about? That's the question from, I would ask, what are they afraid of? And then from that, I would offer this. In all, in every situation, when there is danger, there's also opportunity. In every situation, when there is disruption, there's also opportunity. And I believe that in that space, danger, opportunity, it is a call for us to change. We are in that space right now, in that space of the pandemic, <laughs> we are in the space of change. So as Wayne said, if you are afraid, that is more opportunity to step forward. Because in that stepping forward, you will learn something about yourself. Because the fear, as we have heard, or most of us have heard, fear, false, evidence, appearing, real. And it ain't true. <laughs> That's what it means, it's not true move step forward that's what i would say back to you james thank you very much iqbal uh, as a person who's been in management and has worked in companies and uh things like that i'd love to hear your take on on this well, I, I i think these days uh it will be very odd management if it, they are not encouraging people to open and if they face any <clears throat> discrimination situation and all that, they always tell you to go to HR. And sometimes it's person itself, how comfortable, how strongly they feel about it and so on and so forth. I just recently had an experience. Uh, one of the project I'm managing is making our a company's all websites Yoda compliant from a disability perspective and all that, that they, all the content has to be compliant so that they can be used, utilized by everybody. We were in a meeting 
with one of the information security person and uh, there was one team member from my project team in the meeting. And this info, the information security person made a comment about South Asians having some allies and things along those lines. And my other project team member, obviously he felt uncomfortable and he brought it to uh, his manager's attention and it ended up going to the HR eventually. And then they kind of looked into it and, and called it out. But because there were only very small number of people in the meeting, it became kind of very obvious who complained. It was no longer anonymous. And that really made that project team member very uncomfortable. And he was so apologetic over and over again. I didn't mean anything bad, but it, this thing bothered me. I didn't mean to take it to HR. It, it just bothered me. I shared it with somebody and they took it further and so on. So we have to really, really kind of uh, support that person and say, you did the right thing. You had the courage to do it and, and don't feel bad at the end of the day. Even the person who was complained against would have learned a lesson and they will be a lot more careful about these kind of comments. So I think it's providing the support from the management in these kind of situations is very crucial, critical. You are following the process. If you are able to do it anonymously, I think it makes it more easier to handle. But at the end of the day, you have done the right thing and it's going to make the workplace better place. Very good. Yeah, so stand up, say your voice and, and stand for what's right. That's excellent. Uh, I believe we have another question. Is uh, Ryan? Is that the, our next question? In the, that's up on the screen there. No, nope, that's the the question that was being asked. Um, okay. The next question I'll put in the chat as well. Uh, the less, okay. next question comes from Leslie, and his question is: How do you address preconceived discrimination? Um, preconceived discrimination in an office situation where the hiring practices exclude certain people or persons. So I'll put that in the chat. And if someone wants to answer that question. Yeah. Is there somebody who would like to? Oh, I so want to answer this one. <laughs> Please, Melanie. Thank you. OK, so the reality is there's always going to be unconscious bias, first of all. So there might be people that are in charge of the recruitment processes that automatically don't even go to different groups of people to even let them know what jobs are open. So what needs to happen as a, as a company or organization, you have to create this culture of inclusion from day one, and especially with the HR department, because they're the ones bringing in the talent, the people that will come in. And by them understanding what different groups of individuals can do, um, and let's face it, every different background culture, expertise or ability, bring something different to the table. And when you exclude a certain group of people because of your unconscious bias, you're missing out on a whole concept that your company is gonna lack. And the reality is society wants to feel, as Gerda mentioned, represented. So if we are from a group of individuals, whether it's a disability, a certain background or culture, and we don't see representation at the company, are you gonna to wanna to shop there or get services from them? So if the company as a whole or the organization as a whole doesn't create a culture of inclusion from the get-go in everything they do and the training of their staff, especially at HR, those unconscious biases are bound to come in and they will exclude the talent from certain groups of individuals. So if that's already embedded in the company, then they need to bring in consultants or experienced people to have a sensitivity training and these diversity training because they have to see what they're actually missing by having those unconscious biases come to light. Thanks, James. Thank you very much, Melanie. Does anybody else want to speak to that? And, and I think that's uh, it, it's a great point. And I don't know about when you said companies that hire these people. I, I can understand the question as 
having a bias and not wanting to do it. Let's say, for example, uh, I have a landscaping company. Am I going to hire Wayne? If I didn't see him cut his own lawn, I would not, I would say, no, I can't have blind people apply. But if I saw him cutting his lawn, I'd be saying, I want that guy on my team. Uh, but, but that's an understandable bias. But to, uh, But I guess the idea is that we just need to get rid of it and get rid of those things and saying these people are able, everybody's able to do the positions. Are they physically able of doing it? And if they are, that's all that's needed. Uh, if, sorry, I, I shouldn't have been talking like that. But I'll pass it on. Anybody else have uh, want to answer that? I think yes, I can go ahead. Oh, yes, you got your hand raised. Yes, forgive me. I didn't see that. No, no, no worries. No worries. Thank you. Uh, one situation that, uh, like, when we run into these kind of discrimination, uh, underrepresentation of certain segments of the society, sometimes a uh, very quick, easy solution is mandate. Legislate a certain percentage of the new uh, management positions or a certain percentage of the employees have to be from certain categories and all that. And that I have seen kind of backfire. Uh, I come from India and India is a very cost-based society, especially historically very cost-based society. We are at, at a certain point they reserved the government mandated all businesses, education institutions, everybody to kind of reserve certain percentage of seats for the lower cost. And even though it as a, as a kind of temporary solution, it's it's okay to trying to correct the imbalances if it's too too far out. But longer term, it creates the resentment from the people who are now all of a sudden cannot get selected, even they are better qualified candidates from the work because they, they are not from that caste, that group. So it, it was getting bad to the point that where people with just barely passing grades were getting selected and people with A plus grades and all that, very lot better qualified candidates not getting selected. And no politician wants to touch it because they're afraid of losing the votes from that segment of the society. Because if they change it, then they're going to lose votes. Yes. So quota systems are, uh, are the one thing that I, I, I very much are cautious about not to choose it, even if it's going to be used, should be used with a limit in place. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much, Rikpa. Gerda, I see your hand is raised. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, James. I would say give them homework. <laughs> and what do I mean? Have them read some books. Have them visit different groups. In 2018, I started doing that because for me, it was important for me to understand the First Nations. It was for me to... I wanted to understand that group of people that I did not know much about. And I started to go in different activities that they were doing in different seminars. And that's how I got to learn about who they are and what they re represent. Well, in order to see, because of course, unconscious bias there's a reason we call it unconscious. It's because we're not aware of it. But in order to become aware of something, we need to get accustomed to it. I don't know if you've seen the video where they had asked two different, two different teams were playing and they asked the audience, I want you to count how many times the team with the black t-shirts pass on the ball. That's the only question they ask them. So everybody's there, very focused, counting how many times the ball is being passed. There's a gorilla that passed between <laughs> the players and most people didn't even see it. That's what unconscious bias is. And I thought a gorilla is big enough. How can you not see it? 
but some people did not see it. We see what we are accustomed to see. In order to be accustomed, we need to put ourselves in that situation. We need to get accustomed to the different people that are part of, of different groups. So that's what I would do. Ask them to read some books. Race Against Time is a very good book. So that Race Against Time is a very good book to understand what companies does when they go to a third world country. What we always believe is not necessarily so. So ask them to read, ask them to be involved. Back to you, James. Thank you very much, Greta. All right, I believe we have time for one more question before we start to close it off. Uh, the last question that we have is, what would an organization that fosters a culture of inclusion look like to you? Are you directing that at? I am, it is open to the panel. So whoever wants to uh, raise their hand first or go at it. Um, I can't see the raising hand button. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great okay. Wayne, Wayne, Wayne just raised yeah, his there. physical it's hand. Not... <laughs> okay. okay. So Wayne, Wayne, had to, Wayne beat you it's... to the punch, Melanie. He, he oh, did he? Okay, point. I'll be quiet. Go ahead. Wayne, go ahead. <laughs> I should have put my hand triggers or something. Sorry about that. What does an organization uh, mean to me as, as far as inclusion is concerned or how it would look? What would an organization that fosters the culture of inclusion look like to you? I, it, it would look amazing. Absolutely amazing. I, I think one of the, the biggest misnomers that, that organizations and companies do not do is share their successes. It, it's not that they're using people uh, to pat themselves on the back. It's really letting society know that they are an inclusive company no matter what. Whether it's people with disabilities, whether it's people from different ethnic backgrounds. I was very fortunate that I worked for one of the world's largest communication companies. And I actually would really proudly talk about the company because they were so inclusive. I don't know if they still are today. I left the company probably over 15, 20 years ago now. But the thing that, that really intrigued me is how that they were able to let the world know that they were an inclusive company. Whereas a lot of companies, they don't take the time to do that. And they should be proud with it and, and share their successes not only with the general population, but other organizations and companies that may have that fear factor of like, should we hire these type of people? Or what about lawsuits? Or, or what about this? What about that? If they share that information, their successes, maybe more organizations will be more inclusive. But it would be a wonderful society if companies out there were more inclusive and not afraid of it. Back to you, James. Thank you very much, Wayne. And uh, Melanie and then Krista. So for me, what it would be is that everybody could just be themselves, coming together, sharing thoughts and ideas, feeling that they were being heard, seen and valued. But it's also with the organization being open to receiving feedback and suggestions and how they can be more inclusive. Because as much as we try to be inclusive, we don't live, live everybody's experiences. So we don't know what we don't know. So we have to listen and we have to implement it not as an afterthought or as a, oh my gosh, I have to change this now. But by listening and just doing it just because it's the right thing to do. And each time somebody brings something that will help somebody else, whether they're a member of the organization, a staff, volunteer, or even a guest, that they can feel, walk in the doors or virtually zoom in and feel completely at home just to be themselves. Yes. Thank you very much, Melanie. And Krista. 
I think the inclusion factor in organization needs to look beyond just what you see, but also incorporate different abilities and also different strengths in how we learn and also what we bring to the table as ourselves. So I know that for myself as an empath, I was looked at as maybe too sensitive or maybe not as sales driven or maybe not as you know the hustler that a lot of organizations always want to go for the bottom line meanwhile i was an awesome relationship builder and that was something that was maybe being missed because a lot of success is often just defined as one type of personality so to what melanie said being yourself is really important and being yourself encompassing your whole self not just what you look like or what your physical abilities are or what your your psychological abilities are, but really the character strengths that you bring and not have those always just be one way, that it really encompasses all the strengths to really um, have that, that balance and that complement to make everything really work as it should. Excellent. Okay, there is one last question that came in just in under the wire. So I'm going to ask it and we could have one panelist who could answer. Uh, do we think there will be a day when organizations will have to create an inclusive culture and even make accommodations for people with ADHD? So I see, I see the whole panel yes. is nodding their heads. So yes, I think yes, we, yes, that's yes. Like, unanimously, yes. There again. will be a day. <laughs> there will be a day. And James, I would say this. There will be a day because we would have understood that it's only in understanding how differences, our uniqueness, that we are rich. In regards to the question you asked before, how would an inclusive organization look like? I had the privilege of working in a, a department where they were inclusive. I can tell you the seven years, four years that I worked there in that department, I grew. I learned so much about myself. I felt so accepted. And everyone working together, we grew together. And it brought a very rich environment. So to your question now, yes, once we have understood all this, we will definitely come to that point. Yes. Back to you, James. Okay, <laughs> we have two questions raised up. Annie and then Krista, okay. Okay, uh, I have the privilege to work for one of the uh, big company there as well. It's kind of a good old days uh, when uh, company really focus on people, not just the numbers. Uh, I felt that the, with the pressure of economic uh, situation right now, it has been downgraded a little bit. But uh, before, uh, I had a wonderful experience with this uh, big company. We had different group of uh, culture groups that, that were funded by the company to have different events. And we would have like uh, Asia festival and we have a, like, even have an Indian festival. We ha I had my very first uh, Hannah on my hand on that little festival. So employees from different culture actually stepped in to be proud of their cultures and put something together to present to the whole company, right? We have a culture ambassador to attend events uh, uh, worldwide in order to represent their group. So those are really great things that uh, happened in the business world before. And I like to, um, I, I'm glad a lot of people notice people need to work, uh, individual need to work towards that, but I do think companies should put clear guidelines and money into it to encourage this kind of inclusive culture in a longer period of time. 
All right, sorry, I, I needed to cut you. We're coming close to the very end. Krista, can you in 30 seconds sum up your thing so I can move to close? Or oh, you're on mute, Krista. I just wanted to make a quick note to the comment around ADHD. I think we're already doing that. People just don't know what it is. So if you were to look at somebody and say, hey, do we want to hire people with ADHD? You're putting a label on them. If you say, hey, we need someone who's energetic, who's a multitasker, who is creative, who is a people person, then you're already doing it. I think we have to do away with labels and we have to look at actually what people bring to the table. Very good. All right, with that, thank you very much. And I would like to call on Roger to uh, bring us to a conclusion, Mr. Caesar. Thank you very much, James. To our panelists and to our many, many guests who have come here today to listen to this round table discussion on something that is very important and well needed and of course, relevant in today's society, inclusion to be included, to not feel alone, to always feel like who you are matters. And it's not about the color of your skin. It's not about whether or not we can see or not see your disabilities. What it comes down to is the very essence of who we are as human beings. To understand that each person is valuable and no matter what it is that you bring to the table, you are worth it. And I think that it's important that we have these types of discussions each and every time, whether it's across the table at, with your family, whether it's in situations as this is, or whether it's in companies. Conversations like these, though they may be uncomfortable, though they might make you feel, ah, I don't know if I can speak up, these are the moments that are necessary for us to move forward as human beings. We don't need to see situations happen around us and just turn a blind eye. It's important that we continue to talk, continue to be the voices for the people who cannot speak. Or better yet, I'll say it this way, for us to be the leaders, the ones that stand up for the rights of others. How many times have you yourself been a victim of discrimination or not being included? Now ask yourself, how many times have you been the one who's done it? To today's panelists, I thank you. I thank you for stepping up, for sharing your ideas, for sharing your experiences. For James, Thank you for moderating this spectacular event and allowing each and every member here to voice their opinions as loudly and as proudly as they wanted. And to the many, many people who have joined us today on a Saturday when it's beautiful outside and you could be anywhere in the world, but you've chosen to be with us, we say thank you. And we hope that we educated you today and you walk away from this event clearer in your mind as to what it is that inclusion truly means. And if there are times that you unconsciously are doing something and you didn't realize it, that maybe today's conversation will help you to understand it a little more. I will leave you with these words. Today is a day that we as a society learn to accept each other for who we are, what we are, and what we bring to the table. You are human, and we are worth it. To you, Melanie Tadeo, the champion you, of this entire event. Thank you so much, Roger, for your beautiful words to end off. I'd just like to say a few th words of thanks to my guidance committee for cheering me on every step of the way, good times and bad. To my Zoom masters extraordinaire, to the panelists and every one of you who's come. What comes next, you ask? I'm so glad you asked. Well, I'm putting together a final resource of how to make organizations more inclusive, but I need your help. So everybody, please take a minute or two and just jot down in the chat, what would you like to see in an inclusive 
organization. I'm going to be putting the resource together and sharing it with everyone who's attended any of the events I've done for the Inclusion Impact. Thank you to Raising Champions for always having my back and for being the host of this event and the other. It's amazing when we have a group of people that have your back every step of the way and encourage you to grow and show your abilities. Once again, thank you to everyone here today. The panelists and I will stay around if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask us for a little while. But other than that, I'll hand it to the Sergeant at Arms to close off the meeting, please. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, James. Thank you, panelists. Most of all, thank you to our audience. As Roger said, it is a beautiful day outside here in Ontario, and we don't really want to keep missing it. So uh, we will be closing off shortly. This event was brought to you with the support of Raising Champions Advanced Toastmasters. We meet on the second and fourth Friday every month without fail. We have probably more DTMs than most clubs do, and we invite you to come out to, as a guest, come out and learn with us. We've, we're also known for invading other clubs. If you feel you need to be invaded, just reach out. Our website is on online. We are online with Facebook as well. I took a picture today and we're there. Again, thank you to everybody, and this ends the session. Bye now. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, James. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well done. Woo! Thank you, breathe, everybody, breathe. <laughs> well done. Yes. Well nice done, job. Melanie and team. Thank you. Yeah, you guys did an awesome job. I really um, appreciate this this workshop. Stop the um, recording. Yeah, Melanie, um, just congratulations for putting this on. This was amazing. Uh, since I heard the idea being floated and you called me, I thought it was amazing. I actually dropped out of the 123, District 123 